So the first reading about getting things done at work takes a linguistics approach to workplace communication, which can be applied to virtually any work setting where you're communicating in some way with either your peers or superiors or subordinates. So it could be an office or a factory or a store or a restaurant or even like non-organizational work, like individual work. So you could be an artist or a freelance photographer or graphic designer or entrepreneur. You're still going to be communicating with clients or investors or your personal assistant. Like even in my field of academic work, I see the communicative dynamics uh, laid out in this reading manifest themselves in my work-related interactions as well. So it's relevant and applicable and relatable to just about any work-related experience. So these are sanctioned and recognized lines of communication, such as, you know, taking place in a meeting room. They take place in the, in the formal context of work and are thus on the record, literally, because the authors of this reading had placed microphones in these meeting rooms to record these conversations to then uh, base their linguistic analysis of workplace communication on. And later on with the second reading, we'll compare these formal, sanctioned, recognized lines of communication with unofficial and unsanctioned forms of workplace communication that occur off the record and behind closed doors, such as gossip, which can potentially undermine and destabilize uh, official workplace power relations. And these are micro-level forms of work-related communication, those moment-to-moment -moment interpersonal social interactions that make up our everyday working lives, which again, we'll later compare with the third reading and that macro-level work-related mass communication taking place on that bigger stage uh, of what sort of ideological values companies and businesses implicitly and explicitly communicate through the messaging they use on their websites, uh, social media accounts, corporate policies, etc. A lot of workplace communication, workplace communication primarily involves directives, which are speech acts intended to get someone to do something. And there is a wide range of forms that these directives can take in workplace communication. The reading provides us with all sorts of fancy linguistics terms for exactly what forms these directives are taking. It could take the form of an imperative speech act, such as go close the door, just a straight up direct command of the other person. Or it could be a bit more tactful and ask the other person with an interrogative speech act, such as can you close the door? So asking it in question form. The whole can you interrogative speech act is very common in workplace communication. Or just questions in general, it can come off as a bit more polite to ask, can you do this instead of do this? Or ask, may I have something instead of give me this? Even if formally you're the boss and they're your worker, you don't technically have to be polite, but it's just about maintaining a good relationship. You don't want them to like suddenly resent you by being unduly harsh. It's not even harsh, it's just direct, and that could be interpreted as harsh, even if the person is authorized to do so. And then we also have a declarative hints. So this is where you're not commanding some someone, you're not asking someone, you're just making a, a declaration which is imbued with meaning uh, of a directive. So me declaring the hallway is kind of noisy right now is subtly implying that the hallway is noisy because the door is open. So please someone remedy the situation by closing the door and now the hallway won't be as noisy. And oftentimes we engage in exchanging directives uh, unconsciously and automatically. Like we do it without even realizing what form we're putting that directive into. Like I said, my default automatic one would probably be the interrogative one. Just ask, can you or may I? But then there are cases where we're very conscious and potentially overly aware of how we're saying something in a workplace context. And we have to get very strategic and diplomatic and choose our words carefully, depending on a variety of contextual factors. So the reading mentions uh, the relationship between the issuer of a directive and the recipient. So whether the issuer is the boss and the recipient is the employee or the issuer is the employee and the recipient of the directive is the boss, which could happen and it has happened. If you ever need your boss to do something, you have to issue them a directive. However, uh, indirectly and politely and strategically you go about doing it. Or if the issuer and the recipient are uh, equals, if they're uh, co-workers, 
again, you might need to get a bit more tactful than if the issuer is the boss and the recipient is the employee, in that which case it could be a lot more straightforward. If it's in the employee's job responsibilities to do what the boss is telling them to do, then they could say it as straightforward as they feel uh, comfortable and they feel is acceptable. And not just their formal positions and roles um, and their job responsibilities, but how long they've been working together, how comfortable they are with each other. Like some bosses and employees work together for years and they become very uh, informally close and can communicate in ways that an outsider may be shocked uh, to, to realize that one of them is the boss, one of them is the employee because of how informal it is. So you could get to know each other, your uh, coworkers or your boss, your subordinates, and then you, you learn which modes of communication they respond to. Some of them may respond better with direct directives. You could try to be indirect and give them a hint, but they may not notice the hint or catch the hint or respond to it. So you learn more about the, the idiosyncrasies of each person in your work environment and how to best get them to do what you want them to do. Also, a person's choice of how they issue a directive depends on uh, the context in which that directive is being communicated. So the setting, let's say uh, you need someone to do something while they're on their lunch break, you feel like you're imposing on them. So you have to be mindful of the fact that this isn't a usual place and time to ask this person to do something. So you have to be a bit more polite and hedge your directive with all sorts of modifiers to make it more acceptable in that context. And the context surrounding each of these interactions also includes the culture, the organizational culture that we discussed a couple slides ago. And each culture will come with its own allowable forms of communication. So the reading uh, investigates many different workplace settings, such as offices and including factories. And one of the factory examples of a boss giving their employees a directive was very uh, straightforward. The directives took what the readers, uh, the authors call a bald, unmitigated form because it was just a direct directive, just do this, because that's probably more inherent to that workplace culture, a lot of working class individuals comprising that workplace, so that that blue collar culture leads to blue collar communication, uh, a lot of expletives, but that's seen as acceptable within that context. You take those expletives, uh, that expletive laden directive out of that context and insert it into uh, a business setting, it would probably be deemed uh, unacceptable in that context. It could lead to a, an HR dispute or some sort of complaint. It would just be very jarring in another context. Also, it depends on who the audience is and how many people comprise the audience. If it's just a one to one talk where you're ordering one person in private to do something, it may be different than if you're doing that in front of an audience of people. If you're addressing a whole group, you might uh, feel it to be okay to be a bit more harsh and direct because you feel like no one's no, no one individual is going to take it too personally if you're addressing the whole group this way. But if you're addressing one person in that same uh, harsh, expletive-laden matter manner, then it could be seen as a bullying or picking someone out or picking on them. And then also not just the surrounding context, but then the nature of the directive itself, the, the nature of the thing that you're trying to get someone to do. If it's a routine thing that they do every day and they're expected to do it, you can be very direct in communicating that directive. If it's someone's job to go on a coffee run every morning, then telling them, hey, go get coffee could be seen as acceptable if it's just a routine directive. But if it's a special directive, it's a special task that you're getting them to do that's not in their formal job requirements, then it could um, require a bit more diplomacy. Like asking that same person who just went to go get coffee to to stay late after work and cover your shift, they may be thinking like, uh, I'll get coffee for sure, but that seems a bit too much. So you wouldn't be able to communicate that as directly as you would the coffee task. You might need to cozy up to that person who, who you need to do you a favor and maybe uh, grease them up a little bit, maybe bribe them with a paying for their lunch or something or offering to do a favor in return for this favor. So there's a whole uh, complex ecosystem of directives being exchanged at any workplace. And the form that these directives take uh, often depends on the people exchanging them and the context in which it's happening. But here's where I, I find a problem with this reading. This is this reading is the only new reading uh, uh, for this week's 
lecture, the other two readings I've included in uh, previous uh, offerings of this course. This one is a brand new inclusion this semester, and I find it's not very critical. Like you'd think in terms of the contextual factors that need to be taken into account, the authors would identify contextual factors such as the gender or ethnicity of the people issuing or receiving a directive. That, of course, is going to dramatically affect how these directives are exchanged. Like take an African-American female manager who's trying to issue a directive to uh, a white male subordinate. Do you really think that directive is going to be expressed in the exact same way as if that manager were a white male communicating to another white male subordinate? That's obviously going to play a role in structuring that interaction and structuring the field of potential action for both the issuer and the recipient in that context. And again, there's all sorts of uh, mentions of organizational culture, but not how it affects people in that culture who don't fit in uh, to the dominant gender or ethnicity. So an organizational culture can very strongly overlap and very closely overlap with a uh, white upper class male culture, in which case those who don't fit into that specific subject position and those uh, specific ways of communicating, those communicative tendencies, then they're going to be afforded less power and potential to communicate and have their meaning heard in that context. Like this reading tends to oversimplify a lot of uh, cultural and gender dynamics that we've uh, taken effort to point out so far in this course. Like it tends to paint workplace communication as being very uh, clear cut, cut and dry, but it doesn't take into account the fact that uh, directives can be ignored or rejected by people being insubordinate if their manager doesn't fit into the, the organizational culture gender-wise or ethnicity-wise, or maybe someone may mishear or misinterpret a, a directive because they're not readily accepted as a member of that culture. Like in terms of hints, in order for you to get a hint, you often need to share the same or similar frameworks of meaning to get the underlying message of what's being conveyed in that hint. If you don't have a similar uh, lived experiences or frames of reference to get the hint, then it may go over your head. And then the other people in that workplace culture could see you as incompetent or not good at following orders or any other negative connotation that comes with not fitting in to uh, an organization's culture. So going back to the reading, those in authority roles can employ a variety of linguistic and pragmatic devices to intensify their directives such as increasing the volume of the utterance, addressing the worker directly, such as you close the door, or appealing to something the recipient is likely to comply with. So appealing to authority, saying the boss wants you to do this, or appealing to safety, like if you don't do this, then someone could get hurt, or appealing to team solidarity, like, hey, you wanna be a, a contributing member of the team, don't you? Well, then you gotta do this. All these things turn the heat up on uh, the recipient of the, the directive. This can also include including certain, um, incorporating certain intensifiers, such as very or definitely. So it's very important that you do this, or you definitely have to do this, or just like, I just need you to do this. These are sentence enhancers that modify the meaning of your di uh, directive to make it more uh, intense and strengthen it. There are other uh, modifiers that make the directive more obligatory, such as must and have to. If you put those words in it, then the recipient uh, is perhaps more likely to comply because they'll feel the urgency uh, expressed. And strategies such as repetition. So, hey, have you done that thing I asked you to do yet? We're just repeating the directive in different ways. So that maybe one uh, way will hit uh, ring true or hit home closer for the recipient when it's expressed in a certain way. And then conversely, just as there's all sorts of linguistic uh, techniques and devices to uh, turn up the heat on the recipient, there's also ways of turning down the heat and uh, mitigating their directives instead of intensifying them to reduce the force of that directive. And these uh, techniques and strategies include hedging, which means uh, filling your directives with uh, mitigating terms. So, well, um... I sort of need you to do this, you know? Well, um, sort of, you know, those are all uh, hedge, hedgings. 
that kind of uh, take away a bit of the, the, the certainty, like it's kind of the inverse of must and have to. And they all kind of soften the directive a little bit. And it wasn't until doing this reading and uh, discovering the term hedging that I realized that my sentences are full of hedges. My sentences are like a garden and how many hedges there are. I realize that I hedge a lot. Basically every sentence has a pretty much or you know or just a little bit or just some sort of modifier here and there so that uh, I'm not making definitive black and white statements. I'm always leaving a bit of leeway. And this may be characteristic of a Canadian culture in general. Again, that politeness, how we try not to come off as too direct or harsh and uh, thus we hedge a lot in our speech. It also include modifiers such as would and might. Like it would be nice if, or it might help if, and then comes the directive after the blow has been softened by those kind of terms. And just like repetition can be used to intensify a directive, uh, it can be used to mitigate a directive if you're uh, repeating positive reinforcement. Like you're doing a good job and I need you to do this, but good job though. So you're, you're couching your directive in compliments. Tag questions is when you uh, tag a question at the end of your directive. So I would prefer the door closed, wouldn't you? The, the wouldn't you part is uh, the tag question. And this one's very common too. Again, it's diplomatic to, uh, to go about convincing people in indirect ways. So I would say that, uh, insert directive here, don't you agree? Like the don't you agree is uh, giving them the opportunity to assent to whatever directive you want them to comply with. And uh, you could also use the pronoun we instead of you to make it seem like it's a collective thing, like we're in this together. So instead of I need you to close the door, you could say we need the door to be closed. And various other strategically employed supporting moves that kind of surround and cushion the directive, to kind of bubble wrap the directive before it's sent to the recipient that cushion the directive so that it, it softens the blow, it softens the impact. And people may find themselves complying with whatever you directed them to do without even really realizing it, without even really uh, acknowledging that it's a, it actually is a directive. And again, a lot of it's automatic, like uh, by this point in my life that the hedging thing is kind of uh, an unconscious mechanism. It has to do with our habitus, you know, our, our ingrained habits and dispositions that guide our navigation through the social world. And your habitus will largely determine uh, how you deploy these techniques and to what effect. And again, all those um, contextual factors that we covered on the previous slide and more that I, that I noted weren't really uh, considered by this reading do play a role in what sort of intensifying or mitigating strategies we adopt when conveying directives to others in, at work. And those considerations are reiterated here. Considerations of setting and context, as I mentioned, uh, the nature and length of the relationship between the issuer and the recipient of a directive, and uh, the nature of the required task. So whether it's a routine task or a special task, these factors are all relevant in interpreting the complexities of how people get things done at work. So there's a delicate balance here. It's not just a matter of getting things done as directly and quickly and efficiently as possible. Because if you were to take that approach, it could come at the expense of the relationships you're trying to uh, develop and maintain with others. It's the human aspect. Like if we were all robots and machines, then yeah, you could totally just issue direct orders and no one would take it personally. But humans have notions of uh, politeness and rudeness, however socially constructed they may be. They are still rules and norms that govern our behavior so that we can't always express things as directly as we may want to. We have to take the, the human element into consideration and thus issue our directives in ways that still maintain uh, notions and atmosphere of collegiality and concern for other people's feelings. So politeness. So it's a bit of a compromise between direct efficiency and uh, politeness and maintaining uh, social relations within the workplace. And this quote says managers turn the heat up or down, uh, but it's anyone, it, like I said, it could be employee to manager instead of a manager to employee communication or uh, communication amongst equals at work. Arguably those latter two cases of a uh, employee issuing a directive to their manager or equals uh, issuing directives to each other, they require even more consideration of the, the tactical diplomatic element 
because you could be as rude as you want and you may get them to do the job right here and now the immediate task but who knows further down the line it could uh deteriorate a relationship so that they're less likely to uh, perform and comply for you in the future so it's about getting things done short term but also long term sustainability of that organizational structure and culture uh, culture and composition so a boss telling someone who's working for them already to do something is often a lot more straightforward than another common yet delicate workplace encounter of a worker having to get a fellow worker to do something when they're both at the same level of the institutional hierarchy. People get bossed around at work enough, they don't want to get bossed around by their coworkers too. So this requires even more techniques than a, a more straightforward order being uh, issued. So as mentioned a couple slides ago, appeals to authority. Like they may not take your word for it in terms of what uh, you need them to do, but they're more likely to take a, an authoritative work on it. So if you say the boss wants us to do this or it's company policy that we do this, then invoking that higher power of either a higher authority figure or rules and regulations could get someone to comply more easily than you just saying, uh, I, I need you to do this for me. If you're not doing it on the basis of for you, instead you're on doing it on the basis appealing to some uh, sort of factor that your coworker is likely to take more seriously then it's like you're getting them to do something under the guise of it not being done for you specifically but being done for the good of the company or the good of themselves so this can be a much uh, more tricky task and it often doesn't involve uh, explicit direct uh, imperative directives trying to get an equal to do something when the required action isn't consistent with their status requires considerable attention to politeness considerations because people can be very sensitive regarding their job status and their job responsibilities oftentimes they had to climb the ladder spend a lot of time and effort getting to where they are so when you ask them to do something that they see as beneath their position they may take offense to it they may think that you're not giving them due respect or that you're trying to leapfrog them in the corporate ladder so politeness becomes a paramount above all else. Oftentimes when uh, directives are issued in this context, it's like 10% like of what they're saying is the actual directive and the other 90% is just like fluff and cushion and politeness that they just couch their directive in and just surround it with enough uh, reverence for the uh, recipient and uh, fluff. So that even if they refuse or deny to do what you're asking them to do, at least they won't take offense to it. At least it won't hamper that relationship in the future. So here we have an excerpt of a conversation between Claire and uh, her manager, Tom. The specific nature of their job isn't really pertinent because it could apply to just about any uh, employee boss relationship. There's a lot of the same dynamics here as in any employment situation. So Claire has sought this meeting with Tom because she didn't receive a promotion to manager when uh, another manager had left. She thought uh, she should have been considered, but then someone else got the job over her. So rather than confronting Tom with uh, accusations of how his decision was unfair to hire someone else over her, she frames the issue as a person uh, as a professional development matter. So like her stated reason for meeting with Tom isn't to complain about his decision, but just to ask how she can improve so that she can be better considered for the job next time it comes around. And uh, even I, in my academic job, I've done this exact same thing. Even though I taught this course last semester, at first I didn't get the job. They gave the job to someone else over me, which I thought was kind of confusing because I was the most qualified and experienced applicant. But at that point, once the, once the job had already been offered to someone else, it's not like I would ever complain, try to get it taken away from them because I actually know the person who got the job initially and, and they're great. They would have done a great job. But I did reach out to the department manager and the, the selection committee with full diplomacy and politeness. And I kindly requested how I could, uh, information on how I, and feedback and um, an explanation on how I could improve my application for future uh, attempts. You know, framing it as just me um, for my own professional developing uh, development pur purposes, seeking advice from them on their rationale of behind their hiring decisions and uh, how I could present myself as a more qualified candidate in uh, subsequent future applications. And the department replied with their usual standard boilerplate, 
uh, you know, thank you for your email. Uh, we received uh, many qualified candidates and it was a hard decision, all that. I was just like, whatever, there's not much else I can do. I did the best I could this time around and hopefully they'll consider me more seriously next time. And then a couple of weeks later, the, their, their first choice dropped the position uh, because of what we discussed last week with the whole 20% pay cut thing. Their first choice uh, for the job rightfully didn't like the fact that uh, it paid 20% less than previous semesters. So they declined the position at the last minute and then it was offered to me. And who knows if I didn't reach out to them before that just to ask how I could improve to uh, be considered next time, maybe that made the difference. Maybe that showed them like, wow, this guy genuinely wants to uh, improve. And he didn't complain at all that he didn't get the job the first time. So we should give it to him now. And the rest is history. Because like I said last week with the whole seniority system for sessional instructors, if I didn't get the position last summer or uh, the previous summer, summer 2021, then I would have had less seniority points relative to other applicants for this semester, fall 2021. And I probably would have got the job this semester either. So a little bit of diplomacy can go a long way and just maintaining relationships. Like I could have vented at the communication manager and be like, why didn't you choose me? I'm going to the union. And they, that may have produced some results immediately, you know, positive or negative, but long-term it would have hampered the, the human element of that relationship. The fact that the communication manager just got scolded by this person who didn't get the job, uh, they're likely to, to, uh, to not consider that person favorably for future applications. So this is basically what Claire is trying to do in this situation. She acknowledges that uh, she didn't get the job uh, in the first place. She's at peace with that, but she's just innocently trying to uh, look for ways to improve herself, to be considered more qualified. So Claire says, well, I've been overlooked quite a few times, but I wanted to find out specifically what I could do to help myself be considered next time. Well, I just want to talk to you about it, and I suppose I just want to get some ideas on how, what I could do to actually be considered favorably next time. So these conversations are all audio recorded, so it has every um, minor detail and idiosyncrasy in their speech, even the ums, and people stepping and stumbling over their words, as is natural. Conversations aren't quite as clear-cut as a movie scripts a lot of the time. So later in the conversation, Claire says, I suppose that I just, I suppose I wanted you to sort of look more closely at it from the point of view of opportunities for me as well. So you see the, the sort of there, you see the mitigating terms that soften the blow of what Claire is trying to communicate with her manager, her, her superior, that the higher ups in the situation. Tom then says, yeah. And Claire then says, because I mean, if you go on precedent, and if I don't get any any opportunities, then I don't get considered next time. So she's basically using the same uh, seniority argument that I had in my position, where like, okay, you went on precedent for the initial decision, that's all well and good, but now that's setting a precedent for future uh, hiring decisions. So if I was excluded from that first decision based on your criteria, then I'm going to be excluded every other time from now on. So can you please... Uh, expand your criteria to include other factors that make me qualified. And again, she's framing this uh, for her own professional development. She's talking about opportunities like, hey, I'm an employee. I need to grow. I want to be valuable for you. I can be more valuable for you if you give me opportunities to develop myself professionally. And Tom responds with, hmm. And Claire responds with, and basically, otherwise, I don't see myself moving much. And I don't get any experience myself. And Tom says, hmm. Not very talkative, this Tom. I imagine Tom is actually being held hostage and he has like tape over his mouth right now and he's like, hmm, hmm. And Claire's like, don't you agree, Tom? And he's like, hmm, hmm. And Claire's like, that's right. Did you hear that audio recorder? Tom totally just gave me the promotion. But this is, this is often how conversations go between a subordinate and their superior, especially when the subordinate is trying to get, uh, get something from their superior or get them to do something, it's going to require an awful lot more uh, groundwork and legwork for the subordinate. They're going to have to say a lot more. The, the ratio of who says what in that conversation is going to be 90% subordinate, and then the superior is going to be like, mm-hmm, mm. So Claire uses all sorts of linguistic and pragmatic devices in this conversation, and uh, she appeals to, to logic. Like, Tom can see the logic in what she's saying. She's not blaming him. Like, she understands his decision, but she's just trying to get him to understand her side of things. So just like an appeal to authority or appeal to uh, safety or appeal to solidarity, there's an appeal to reason here. 
She thinks Tom is reasonable enough to see the logic in what she's saying. And as long as it's not presented too harshly or too directly and it's framed as just a Claire trying to get feedback from this superior who she respects, definitely makes it a lot more uh, palatable and digestible for Tom. So this reading briefly touches on power relations. It just mentions it once or twice. And it's not nearly as comprehensive or in-depth as any other uh, considerations of power we've had so far in this course. Like it tends to hold a very static view of power as you would call a sovereign power. as just this static thing that people in a certain position hold. So the, the authors would say in this case that Tom has official formal power over Claire because he's in a, a superior position at the workplace. But we, with our Foucauldian frameworks for viewing power, even at the micro level of everyday interactions such as this, would see a lot more dynamic power flowing between and from Claire and Tom. Power isn't just the formal power of a manager over the, their employees or a CEO over the manager. So this reading examines various modalities of communication that are employed during employment but it doesn't get more critical to explore other modalities of power that are at work at work. So that's another criticism of this reading is that it's not critical enough of uh, gender or ethnicity or power uh, implications and considerations. But I'm sure you've all been uh, in a similar situation to Claire where you're trying to request something from uh, someone in a, in a position of authority over you. And it can be kind of like walking on eggshells. You got to be very strategic and sensitive and you'll have to skillfully employ a lot of these indirect strategies and uh, linguistic devices. Some of them, again, you're doing it consciously and uh, strategically. Other times it's, it's, it's unconscious and automatic as just an ingrained part of your habitus that when you're speaking to uh, an authority figure, you conduct yourself in a certain way during those interactions. I once organized uh, this conference with this uh, very senior academic in the department. They're retired now, but at the time they were very highly revered, not just in the department, not just at, at SFU, but worldwide, they were a renowned scholar. They were brilliant, but they were also uh, a bit unfamiliar with modern digital technology and how often those modes of online communication are used for organizing a conference. So I often had to get this guy, this extremely well-established academic to, to sign forms or to send an email or to make a phone call. And I was very conscious in those moments of being delicate in uh, sending my directive upwards. I was fully aware of the fact that I was just a grad student and this person had accomplished everything that I could ever dream of accomplishing in this field. And that I really have no right to uh, direct this person to do anything. So I had to underscore my requests with just the utmost reverence and uh, delicateness. And like I said, often it's a one-way street. There's no required reciprocity for the superior to treat you uh, with the same politeness and delicateness that you're treating them. So oftentimes when I need them to like sign a form, I'll email them like this essay of just a lot of fluff to, to couch my request for them to sign it. And then they'll respond with a three word response. It's like, yeah, got it. But again, that's not just purely about our uh, positions in respect to each other and more about our working relationship and the quality and the length of that relationship. So take a personal assistant. Let's say that same academic who organized a conference with me, they have a personal assistant who's been working with them for decades. Despite the fact that the, the distance between his position as the academic and uh, their position as a personal assistant could be similar uh, to my distance from the academic. The fact that they've been working so long with each other and that I imagine a lot of the requests uh, the assistant is making to their um, superior regarding you know getting stuff signed, similar things that I needed them to get done, they can probably do a lot more directly because those would be routine tasks as opposed to in our situation, organizing a conference. It was a special task. It was like a one-time task that I had to... Uh, really go out of my way to ask from them. But a personal assistant could just say, hey, sign this, or can you sign this? So here's another excerpt of a workplace conversation where this time uh, Nicola is junior to Claire. So Claire's back, but now she's on the receiving end of a directive. And this interaction exemplifies and demonstrates that non-routine tasks and special requests require more mitigated and less direct forms for that directive to take. So Nicola is trying to offload a responsibility onto Claire 
which is it's tough because Claire isn't underneath Nicola, and they're from different departments, so there's all sorts of conflicts uh, over their perspectives of uh, who has jurisdiction over what and, and uh, what is whose responsibility. So Nicola starts. I think first she invited Claire under different pretenses. She she uh, started this meeting under the pretense that she was like asking Claire for advice. Similar to what Claire did with Tom, so turnabout is fair play. Nicola says, well, um, the thing is that the minister needs to be briefed. Remember we talked about that? So she's introducing uh, gradually and indirectly the request that she's going to make, that the minister needs to be briefed. Who's going to do it? And she reminds Claire in that first line that they've already agreed that a briefing a paper is needed. She says, remember we talked about that? So there's repetition here too. And Claire cuts her off and says, yeah. And then Nicola says, and that you did the original brief. And Tom, oh, there's Tom again. Tom's not wanting me to do the brief because it's not our work. Besides, Tom's still being held hostage in his office. So there's an appeal to authority here because Tom is Claire's manager too. As soon as she name drops Tom, she invokes that authority's name. She's basically saying that I'm not saying this myself. This is coming from up top, the higher up. So this isn't so much me asking you to do this. This isn't me, Nicola, asking you to do this. This is me on behalf of Tom by proxy. And Nicola also says in that line that you, Claire, did the original brief. So that, that can kind of serve as the basis of, well, you did the first one. And then Claire says, oh, and you wanted to bring it over here. I think those lines are saying that like uh, the here overlaps with Nicola's yeah in the next line. So whenever you see that, it's just like interrupting or overlapping. So it's not even until well into the conversation that it dawns on Claire what the real reason for that conversation was. That Nicola didn't just simply come there for advice or information. She has another ulterior motive, another objective for that conversation. So Nicola confirms uh, Claire's realization when she says yeah. And we're wondering if you could do the brief. So she makes it explicit now, finally, because we're not going to. And because you've got the first one. And then Claire, uh, Claire draws, oh, like she, it, it really um, dawns on her, the realization. And Nicola just kind of like steamrolls right through and like, we were just hoping you could whittle down what you wrote last year and just, and then she inhales because she's like out of breath. Because I imagine it's quite stressful for her asking, uh, in the most diplomatic, indirect way possible for her superior to do something. So you can see a lot of hedging here to minimize the the magnitude of the task that's being requested of Claire. So she says, we were just hoping you could whittle down what you wrote last year. So the we there, remember using the we pronoun instead of I versus you. And the word just there, it kind of minimizes, like, hey, just do this. Like, it makes it seem like it's not a big deal. Like, they're not imposing upon you that much to do this minimal requirement. And the word hoping, like, I'm hoping you can do that. How many times have you seen that email? Like, I hope you'll agree, or I hope to hear back from you soon. It's like the ultimate hedging in any polite communication. And it's this uh, subtle negotiation, it's this tug of war. Like, you don't see it on the surface, but basically, it's a tug of war. Or the opposite, a push of war, where one department is trying to push a task onto another, and the other department is trying to push back and say, no, nope, that's not our job, that's yours. But on the surface, it just sounds like a polite, productive, constructive conversation. And Claire is, is a player in the game, too. She's not just outwardly, explicitly saying no. Uh, she ends this portion of the conversation by saying, the problem I've got is that, um, um, like now she knows that this is the game we're playing, Nicola, that this is what you're asking me to do. I'm going to push back, but I want to play the game by your rules. I'm going to do it just as diplomatically and let's see who wins. Like this exact directive of getting someone in another department to do something could take any number of forms. But this is a form that allows for a collegiality between the parties. There's no direct antagonism. There's no blaming. There's no finger pointing. There's no yelling. There's no throwing of bricks through windows. It's done in a sustainable way that maintains relationships so that a, a bridge isn't burned between Nicola and Claire. Finally, let's learn to take a hint, shall we? So the least direct way of communicating, or one of the less or least direct ways of communicating directives at work is through hints, dropping hints, which are utterances where the directive intent, intent is not directly or conventionally derivable from the words uttered. Rather, 
recipients of that directive that's been hinted at them must infer what's required from their knowledge of the, the surrounding context. So there's no direct uh, conveyance of meaning. It's all implicitly conveyed by the sender and it's then uh, inferred by the receiver. So a hint given earlier in this lecture was uh, the hallway noise is kind of loud or, oh, it's getting kind of chilly in here, hint, hint. If someone has to say hint, hint, then it's probably not a very good hint, but you know what I mean. And if they have to say you know what I mean, then it's also probably not a very good hint. But those are cases where what's being, the, the directive intent uh, needs to be inferred with a, by the surrounding context. So the person in that context has to look around and say, oh, the door is open. Maybe that's why this person is, is declaring that it's chilly or it's loud outside. So the directive intent is inferred from the social context of that interaction. So the role relations that the, fir that the person who's being hinted at to close the door is in a, a subordinate role, is in a role where that could be expected of them to have to close the door. And the rights and obligations of participants. So it's within the realm of acceptability that the person issuing that hint to you has has the right to at, to request that of you if they didn't then you could infer that they're just chilly or that they, they're just sensitive to noise and also the the discourse context that the reading mentions so the the supporting moves that precede and follow that um hint so maybe before the person says hey it's quite noisy in the hallway they're kind of like staring at the door and they keep looking at the door to try to make it obvious that that's what they're referring to. Or there might be an awkward silence after their hint, and they might go, <clears throat> and if you hear someone do that and you give them a cough drop, that probably means you missed the hint. So the reading uh, mentions social context and discourse context, but first of all, discourse is not Foucauldian discourse. I think Foucault did a disservice to philosophy when he termed the modes of social construction and power that he identified as discourse, because a lot of people just conflate that and reduce it to uh, verbal spoken discourse. So discourse in either of the linguistics readings, this one or the crystal one, does not mean discourse for the purpose of discourse, this course. We're operating at a more complex and sophisticated philosophical and conceptual level. But anyways, those are two contexts. But what about, like I said, the, the cultural context, the fact that this is uh, occurring within an organizational culture, a certain workplace culture? And what if that culture is a boys club, an old boys network, as discussed last week? Then people who aren't uh, white, upper-class males, they may not get the hint because the hint wasn't intended for them. Like, there are ways for people to talk about others in their proximity by talking about them indirectly. And this can be very exclusionary. Like, I'm sure you've experienced hanging out with a couple of friends and they speak a different language, or they can speak a different language. Like, let's say you're hanging out with a pair of Hungarian siblings who can speak English, of course, and do speak English to you, but then all of a sudden they break out into Hungarian and just talk to each other when you're right in their presence. You can feel kind of excluded. You feel that's kind of rude. Like, why not just speak in English so that I can understand and participate? And you start to wonder, like, are they talking about me? Is that the reason why they suddenly switched to a different language while talking in my proximity? People can speak in a different language without speaking in a language other than English. They can use hints and lexicon and uh, the conversational styles and meta communication that are more aligned with a certain culture, white upper class male culture. So that even if people in your presence are speaking English, they could be hinting and speaking indirectly in a way that they're talking about you or they're excluding you and you wouldn't even know it or you wouldn't feel it as overtly as the, the Hungarian language example. So take golf references and golf terminology and golf metaphors. Like in order to play golf and be experienced with golf, uh, you often need to have a, sort of a, somewhat of a privileged upbringing to be able to afford the equipment and the lessons and uh, the fees to go play golf at a course and the uh, membership costs. So now imagine a workplace where most of the people fit into that white upper class, older male culture. And one person who doesn't, let's say a young woman of color, who's familiar with golf, but hasn't had the opportunities to get that level of familiarity with it that these guys have playing golf their whole lives. If those guys start joking around and making hints about their female coworker being subpar or a bogey 
or is taking a mulligan or is one hole short of a tour, whatever that would mean. These could be hints that in order for you to infer the meaning and derive meaning from it, you need to have awareness uh, and knowledge of not just the social context and the speech act context in which it's occurring. It requires all sorts of uh, culturally imbued knowledge that could exclude others quite easily in informal ways. So we're starting to get into more informal modes of communication, like hints aren't part of like the communication policies of an organization. And as such, they don't run along the same lines of power that the formal uh, modes of communication do. Like I'm sure there's no uh, formal rules in place that that woman of color needs to be or should be excluded in communication. And they probably aren't in the formal modes of communication. Like they aren't like kicked out of meetings because they don't know golf, but they could be excluded from uh, social opportunities and networking opportunities and career opportunities and have people talking about them even well, right in front of them. So not just talking behind their back, but right in front of them. So that even though there's no formal mechanisms that uh, exclude uh, a worker in that environment, for all intents and purposes, they could be practically excluded due to these informal modes of communication that predominate a lot of workplace communication.